Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here, and I appreciate very much what Genspect is doing and what we have learned so far and what we are going to be seeing today. I am hoping to bring some language and some scientific context, especially for parents and young people who are struggling with the madness that is taking over, so that uh, we can go back out into the world and have more informed conversations rife with truth and with respect for the people that we are talking with. A little forward? OK. Um, both, both with respect and compassion and, and, and truth. Um, so that we can hopefully break out of this. So this is a scientific talk primarily, uh, and that is my, my main message, but I also want to tell a personal story first because I would not be able to be standing up here with a scientific message, but for the fact of the personal. And I have to find this and remember which way it goes. Here we go. So that's me in the field in Madagascar in the 90s. I earned a PhD doing field work halfway around the world and um, in a place where there was little infrastructure to support what I was doing. I slept in a tent, showered in a waterfall, and spent my days trying to discover the evolutionary and ecology truths of poison frogs. And I was working in Madagascar just a few years after they opened their borders for the first time in a few decades. This is work that was literally considered un unavailable to women. Uh, until just a few decades before I was doing it. And of course in the 60s, there are a few names that we all know, Jane Goodall and then Diane Fossey and Bruta Galdikas working on the great apes and many more people since then, many more women known within animal behavior who went out into deep nature and did work discovering what is true about organisms that are not us and so put the lie to the long held belief that women couldn't do this. As a girl, I was interested in things that only boys were supposed to be interested in. Math and sports and taking risks and building things. And this was the 1970s and 80s and my father, who was a computer scientist, facilitated me in, in my interests. He, he knew that I had capacity and interest and that there was nothing actually uh, that he should tell me about me being more likely to be able to be, proceed and succeed because I was a female or less likely. He treated me equally. This even though he actually wanted a son and he wanted a son in part because he wanted to do the very things he would go on to do with me. Play ball and build fences and go on adventures and compete in math tournaments. But once I was there, it was clear that I was interested, I was willing, I was capable and so no one in my family ever wished I was a boy once I was born, ever thought I was a boy, and that, that was what living as a gender non-conforming girl in the 1970s and 80s afforded me. Later, I had mentors, formidable male mentors who were giants in their field, Bob Trivers, Dick Alexander, and um, Arnold Kluge, and they did the same thing. They gave me no free passes, and they didn't treat me as if I couldn't do things or kept me from risk because I was female. This is exactly as it should have been. And so I'm here in part today because I was able to do that, and it seemed to me at the time like this was the way the world was moving. Obviously not all women growing up, girls growing up in the 70s and 80s had those opportunities that I had, but many of us did, and it seemed like all, everyone could in the future, but no. The new gender ideology would have me believe that I was wrong about myself, that I was a boy all along. And this is really, really disturbing in part because I'm a scientist, but I'm also a mother. That's the wrong way. I'm also a mother. This is me with my first son, um, gosh, probably 18 years ago now. And um, I'm the mother of two extraordinary now young men and in part what I've been able to do as both a scientist and a mother is take my children into the field. Here's me with my younger son about 10 years ago on a tributary of the Amazon so that I can teach them part of the joy and wisdom of being in wild deep nature. As much, so the most horrifying thing I think about the new gender ideology and that's, you know, that's a big statement because there's a lot that's horrifying about it uh, is that I could have had those children taken from me by the fact that I could have been made infertile by treatments that might have been pushed on me because I seemed to be acting like a boy. 
Even though no one in my environment thought I was a boy, I was doing the boy stuff. Furthermore, when I was a child, I didn't want to have children. I did not want to have children. I just wasn't daydreaming about weddings or having princess fantasies. It just wasn't the kind of kid I was, and so children weren't on my mind. And so if someone had said to me, hey, there's this treatment and maybe you should get it, and infertility is a, is a result, it wouldn't have occurred to me maybe that this was something that was really important. And so I could have lost these children. Might have been able to be a scientist, maybe, but I could have lost these children to the ideology, and that's unacceptable. It's utterly unacceptable. So not only was I ch able to choose to be a scientist and a mother, importantly, I was able to choose to be both. And that, is, that was progress in the 70s and 80s, and it felt like it was going to grow. That's what a liberated girl growing up in the 70s and 80s could do. We're moving backwards. And I do wonder what the world thinks about giving up on that level of empowerment and liberation. Okay, that's the personal story. Now on to some of the science. I'm gonna provide a very rapid tour of some evolutionary basics. I know that Colin Wright is coming after me to talk about some of the same things. Um, that will hopefully in the spirit of uh, when, uh, when you hear things twice, it's more likely to stick, um, help things stick. So all of life on Earth is related to one another. Oh, I just want to apologize. Um, I care a lot about aesthetics, and the font got messed up in translating this onto a PC. So um, I, this, this is not my choice of font, and some of the spacing is going to be weird. Um, but this is, this is a beautiful tree of life, and the point is not that you understand what all is on it, but that we share a single origin. Beginning, you know, almost from the beginning, we had our informational molecule, which is DNA, uh, which, uh, which is shared with all of us. Uh, that, is, that is the commonality, but we began to diverge very, very quickly. And, um, it was a humble beginning, it was a critical beginning, and the diversity of life on Earth that we have now uh, reveals, uh, reveals fantastic, fantastic diversity such as this. This is an echinoderm, a relative of a starfish. Uh, life began four-ish billion years ago. Sex evolved one to two billion years ago. That's a long time ago. Within our lineage, conservative estimate is we have been sexually reproducing uninterrupted. That is, none of our, within the lineage that never tried to go back to asexual reproduction for about 500 million years. So okay, is it two billion? Is it a mere 500 million? that we have been reproducing sexually, uninterrupted in our lineage. Either way, it's kind of a long time, right? <laughs> and the fact that it sticks, like there's very, very few organisms out there that actually evolved sex and then went, yeah, no, not for me, I'm going back. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about when that happens, but um, like hearts and bone, like when hearts evolve, they don't disappear. When bone evolves, it doesn't disappear. It changes, it moves around in shape and, and, and form and function and such, but it doesn't disappear. Uh, sex doesn't tend to disappear, doesn't tend to, um, t tend to reverse when it evolves, unlike legs. I'm not telling you legs aren't important, right? But legs disappear on us. Like snakes have legs in their ancestry, and then they went, you know what, we can do without those. So sex is at some level more fundamental and basic to what we are even than legs. So, why sex? Why is there sex at all? Well, if, what sex is, first, what is sex? Sex is the bringing together of genes from multiple individuals. Could be more than two, uh, but as we'll get to, uh, it generally isn't. Uh, so, if, well, let's first talk about the cost of sex. It seems like an obvious thing. We're humans sitting in this room. We know what sex is. Obviously, we have sex to make kids. But um, there were a couple billion years of life on the planet before sex existed. And therefore, organisms were simply making more copies, or there's a little bit more detail there, but uh, making more copies of themselves-ish uh, to spread into the environment. Uh, and the fact is, sex is costly. It takes time and effort to find mates, to convince them to mate with you, to make babies, to take care of those babies, if, if that's the kind of person you are, if that's the kind of organism you are. Um, and the biggest problem, and there, there are many costs of sex, but the biggest problem is the so-called two-fold cost of sex, which is that if you clone yourself, you are producing 100% of your genes in the next in, in every offspring that you have. And because that is the banal, uninteresting, but 
goal of evolution, uh, Evolution has an interest. Your genes have an interest in you passing as many copies on as possible. And so when you combine your genome with another individual and you only pass 50% of your genes on, well, that's a cost. So the question, and it's, it's still a live question in evolutionary biology, has always been, like, why? Why do, why do we do it? Um, why have sex at all? Well, if the environment is utterly stable and it's going to remain utterly stable, and you're doing pretty well in the environment, then okay, you can clone yourself. That is, if, if you've got this and, uh, and everything's gonna stay the same, clone away, but change happens, right? Nothing is stable. Everything from, from the weather and the climate, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, competitors and predators come at you. And if you are only able to leave copies of yourself exactly in the next generation, then, um, then they are unlikely to be able to deal with change. So sexual reproduction allows for a, a novel adaptive response to change. And that means <clears throat> that those individuals that are offspring of sexual reproduction are better able to deal with things like, again, predators and competitors and pathogens and parasites. So why two? Why are there two sexes? For sex to work, you need more than the nuclear DNA to combine. You can't just like jam a bunch of genes together in space and make a baby. It doesn't work, right? You need the, the stuff of the cell. You need the cytoplasm of the cell, the mitochondria and the ribosomes and all the other stuff that makes a cell work. So that's one thing you need in addition to genes. The other thing you need in addition to genes is that uh, the sex cells, the gametes, need to be able to find one another. And so mathematically, what we see and what is borne out by both, um, by both theory and empiricism, by both like what we see on the planet, is that literally in every single plant and animal on the planet, you have anisogamy, two discrete types of gametes. Because one type of gamete, we call it an egg, tends to have all of the cytoplasm and be relatively sessile, doesn't move around much. And the other type of gamete, in animals, we call it sperm. In plants, we call it pollen. Is stripped of all the cellular machinery. It's basically just got the nuclear DNA and a motor, if it's a sperm. And it is seeking, its job is to only bring nuclear DNA to the egg, which brings everything else, but to find the egg. And so we have, from there, the fact that intermediate gametes don't really work. If you have a bunch of gametes that are kind of able to move around, but not really, then they're less likely to find each other. And if they're kind of full of cytoplasm, but not really, when they do meet, they're likely to disagree, and this sounds anthropomorphic, but they're likely to disagree about whose cytoplasm to use. So you have this disruptive selection towards eggs and sperm, and there's only two types. It's called anisogamy, and from there, the sex binary is born. That's what it is. So sex is not at its most fundamental about chromosomes or hormones, about you know, facial hair or breasts, about culture or cultural norms or behavior. It's fundamentally about this, about the fact that, again, in every single animal and plant on the planet, we have two and only two sexes, and, uh, and what sex you are depends on what gamete you can or could or will or would produce. OK, what about gender? Well, in other species, we call gender sex role. And yeah, other species have sex roles. And I'm going to use the terms probably interchangeably. I'll probably default to gender. But know that over in non-human evolutionary biology space, we don't use the term gender. We call them sex roles. So what sex roles are are the behaviors that tend to be downstream of the sex that you are. And so for instance, you have um, the budding of antlers in male moose. It's a male sex role. Or the, uh, the flagging of the dewlap, the colorful dewlap in Norops lizards. Uh, again, a male sex role. Or the dances and songs of many birds and other dinosaurs like these oviraptors, which fossil evidence suggests were actually the males on the right. And this is obviously an artist reconstruction. Um, I don't have access to real oviraptors. But a fossil reconstruction of <clears throat> what we think happened from fossil evidence where males are shaking their tail feathers at females in order to attract them, in order to uh, end up engaging in sexual reproduction with them. All right, so gender is the software of sex. Sex role is the software of sex. It's downstream of sex. Sex is binary, gender is not, of course. 
and humans being more software than any other species on the planet. We are born not blank slates at all, but with more capacity to become anything we want than any other species on the planet. Because of that, of course, we end up playing a lot with gender and with the roles that, yes, came down to us from evolution, but that doesn't mean they're not immutable. Furthermore, even in species that have lost sex, sexual behavior and roles persist. Here, we have some lizard erotica. I'm not calling it lizard porn because no one was trying to make a buck from taking these pictures. <laughs> so we've got a male on top and a female on the bottom engaging in courtship and copulation. And these are pictures from the 80s and black and whites. So they're not perfect, but um, you get the picture. Uh, you can imagine how lizards have sex. Um, However, these, this is Nemodophorus, it's a, it's a whiptail lizard lineage. And in this lineage, this is one of the very few lineages in vertebrates that actually sometimes goes asexual. And when they go asexual, the sexual behaviors persist. On the right here is an entirely asexual species, which means it's made entirely of females. Because again, remember, what are the gametes? What are the, what are the sexes? You can't make a baby with sperm. It doesn't have the cytoplasm. So when species go asexual, they're all female now. They're producing eggs and only eggs, and that's the only kind of organism there is in that species. So on the right, we have Nemodophorus uniparens, uh, another whiptail species that's closely related, engaging, that's two females, engaging in what looks like the very same sexual behavior. And indeed, the sexual behavior changes throughout the ovarian cycle. So pre-ovulation, females uh, partake in female typical behavior and receive mounting from, the, from other females. And after ovulation, the females switch roles and they adopt male typical behavior and mount other females. So this points out how, uh, how ancient some of these, some, some gender can be, some sex roles can be, and also even in lizards, even in lizards, just because you act like a male, doesn't mean that you are a male. <laughs> so, there are a lot of reasons to expect differences between sexes and humans, but is there any evidence that it actually exists? Well, yes, of course there is, of course there is. This is my last um, non-human example before I get to some of the human evidence. Um, these are blue-footed boobies. Ornithologists name birds very strange things. Um, these are blue-footed boobies from the Galapagos. These are socially, this is a socially monogamous bird uh, that uh, tends to pair bond for, for a while. And this is a pair, I assume. Uh, I, did, I did not do research on these, but um, my husband and I were in Galapagos together leading a study abroad trip and, and saw this pair and, it, and they were behaving like they were, um, they were coupled. The female is in front. And you have to kind of pick up on subtle cues to tell that they're different. The female is a little bit larger bodied, her feet are a little bit of a paler blue, her iris is a little smaller, like it's subtle, right? And this tends to be the case in the more monogamous organisms. The more monogamous you are, the less, dis the less dimorphic you tend to be. Um, these guys also have different songs. And I, I find this, this interesting, just as an aside, um, you know, sound can be described by amplitude and by frequency. And the, what is it, the females, um, the females change their songs by amplitude and the males change their songs by frequency. And it doesn't matter, like it could be the reverse. The point is they're different because the difference is interesting. The difference has value. The difference, and I'll be talking later at the end of the talk about division of labor and what its value is. The very fact of the difference is what the value is, but it doesn't say anything about the inherent worth or talents of the individuals involved. All right, so three kinds of difference that we could talk about with regard to sex, with regard to anything really. Um, uh, are, and this is gonna be just a tiny bit statistical um, briefly here, are going to be about differences of, of mean, of average, differences of variance or standard deviation, and then differences of type. So differences of mean um, means that, um, that you will have population distributions, that when you say the average American woman, and I, I actually haven't looked this up, say the average American woman is five foot five. I don't know if that's still true, it was true at one point. The average American woman is five, point, is five foot five inches, 
um, does not obviously mean that all American women are five foot five inches. It's a population distribution. And with regard to height, that follows a normal distribution, a bell curve like I've got here, and a lot of characters do. Uh, for reasons that I won't go into here. Not all characters do, but all characters that have variation, all things like height or tendency towards anxiety or math ability will have a distribution. And so when we say, oh, there are some differences in means between males and females, what we are not saying is that all males are better or worse than all females, but that there's a distribution and that knowing nothing else about the situation. If you know that one statistic, you might want to predict that it's gonna be females who have greater linguistic capacity, for instance. So just as nobody thinks that being a short boy makes you a woman, you shouldn't imagine that being a girl who likes math or a boy who likes to play dress up is the sex that they are not. Okay, so that's different means. Different standard deviations uh, is a difference in spread, and we'll come back to that in a couple minutes. And then different types. So uh, complex characters like competition, like uh, memory, uh, like creativity, in fact, uh, may manifest differently between the sexes, even if the means and the standard deviations are the same. And we shouldn't be scared of this. For one thing, your evolution, except for a few things, is almost never your fate. And again, we're talking about distributions. Okay, so here's just a few. The, the literature is rife with this. Some of the research is bad, as always. Um, but here are some findings that um, are robust and seem to be uh, standing the test of time. On average, um, women are more likely to have anxiety disorders, and men are more likely to have ADHD. Men prefer working with things. Women prefer working with people. Men have more investigative interests, women have more artistic and social interests. Men are more, men are also on average, more interested, interested in math, science, and engineering. Note, not talented in, interested in. <laughs> because of course this has been a claim, and it's possible that it could be true, it just doesn't seem to be. Our brains are different. Men's brains have higher relative proportions, that is, going to cause someone an epileptic fit over there. <laughs> Our brains are different. Uh, men's brains have higher relative proportions of white matter, while women's brains have higher uh, proportions of gray matter. Which is better? Neither is better. They're both good. They're both good at different things, right? And finally, girls score higher in literacy, and boys score higher in math. That's just a few. There's a lot. There's a lot of differences different standard deviations. The greater male variability hypothesis posits that, um, posits that, and there is support for it, uh, that for many of the characteristics for which men and women are identical with regard to the average, like, for instance, intelligence, cognitive capacity, not to say that there haven't been many attempts to demonstrate that men are smarter than women or that women are smarter than men, those attempts have failed, pretty much, um, but, one of the places with regard to cognitive capacity that we do see robust support is with regard to this greater male variability hypothesis, which is to say that even though we, it seems that men and women are more or less the same with regard to mean IQ, there are more male geniuses and more male morons. <laughs> fewer female geniuses, fewer female morons. Not none, we see, and uh, at 140, uh, so they, they stopped taking data um, at 60 and 140, um, but there's still plenty, this is, this is from a very large study um, in Scotland uh, from the 1930s, actually, giant study, huge number, huge N, huge sample size. Um, still lots of female geniuses, just not as many as there were men, and still lots of female morons, just not as many as there were men. So. This is true, and it may make some people uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that it's not true, right? So, let's see. Let's move on. So we talked about different means. Men and women are on average different heights, have different, different kinds of mental illnesses when they have mental illnesses. Um, they have different kinds of interests when free to choose. 
the greater male variability hypothesis uh, is, we're still in relatively new in the research, but um, we have support for cognitive capacity with regard to that. Again, more male geniuses and morons. Um, but also, like, creativity. There are a number of complex traits for which the greater male variability hypothesis seems to hold up. And then different types. So a complex character like degree of competitiveness, competitiveness, for instance, uh, may have the same mean standard deviation for men and women, but the way that we do it and how it manifests in the world may well be different. And in fact, it is. And I'll come back to that. But first, let's talk about gist versus details. So this is, this is some relatively new research that I just find fascinating. And I'm only going to talk about a little bit of it here. Um, but the, the conclusion is this. Men are more likely to attend to and remember the gist of a situation the central information or a scene. And women are more likely to attend to and remember details, the peripheral information of a scene or situation. This is holds across a number of domains. And, um, and many people are probably nodding along, which not all evolutionary biology research immediately causes you to say, ah, I thought so. But often it does, right? Like often it fits with our intuition. And sometimes our intuitions are wrong and sometimes the research is wrong. In this case, I think the research is compelling and strong and it does also fit with our intuition about things. So a few of the ways that um, this research revealed this or a few of the domains in which it was revealed are um, sex differences in emotional memory. So women communicate emotional information non-verbally with greater accuracy are more accurate in identifying emotional expressivity in others, and retain more autobiographical details than do men. Okay. And, no? Okay. And sex differences in, sorry, spatial uh, ability. Men tend to notice and remember the gist of where they or objects are in space. They perform better in root learning and mental rotation. The mental rotation is one that's pretty familiar to a lot of people, right? This idea of being able to rotate things in space. Again, plenty of women are great at this, and some women, some men suck at it. But in, uh, on average, men are a little bit better at this. And women are more likely to recall the details of the space around them. <laughs> they more accurately remember the location of things like the keys, right? <laughs> So here's some neurobiological research that supports what we know, right? If, if you have lived with a member of the opposite sex, you know this. And the research bears it out. Again, this is uh, Herrera et al. from uh, 2019. This is research from um, not too long ago. OK, um, differences in ability versus preference. Uh, this, this graph is a little bit hard to parse, but the short version is, um, that researchers wanted to look at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM uh, performance between males and females in various countries, and then they separately, in those same countries, went and looked at measures of gender equality in those countries. So when you hear, okay, what are the most gender equal countries, probably you tend to think of Scandinavia, right? And when you hear what are the gender unequal countries, places like, well, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, okay? Uh, and so what we have here is a, a comparison between gender equality in countries and the number of males versus females that go into STEM fields. And the counterintuitive this time, the very counterintuitive result, is that the more gender equal the countries, the fewer girls go into the STEM fields. Again, this says nothing about capacity. What it says, really, is that when free to choose, women are less likely to go into these fields, which suggests that maybe some of what the social engineering that we're doing in this country and others may backfire uh, because what we would like to do, what we'd really like to do is allow everyone, men and women, to feel free to choose what they are most interested in and most capable of doing good in the world with, rather than say, oh, but we need more of you over there, so can you please go over there now? Uh, so in, you know, in Iceland, in Norway, in Finland, in Sweden, you had um, women choosing because they could to go into STEM fields less often. Okay. The scientific literature 
the scientific literature, is rife with the claim that women aren't competitive. And in fact, you'll hear this sometimes in conversation as well, women aren't competitive. Well, of course we are. This is insane, right? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is absurd on its face. And even, even if we're talking about sport, uh, women are competitive, and we'll be hearing from Linda Blade later about sport. Um, but even if you're just talking about sport, um, let me just give you a brief anecdote about Ultimate, which is, is I, I don't know these people, um, but um, I used to play a lot of Ultimate Frisbee, and I played both on all women's teams and co-ed teams. And what I can tell you for sure is that the all-male games that I watched some of when, when in tournaments uh, tend to be faster, there are a lot of long hucks into the end zone, and the all-female games are um, more, more shorter passes, and more members of the team tend to touch the disc at any given point. It's more collaborative. Uh, and frankly, the best of both worlds come together in co-ed, in Ultimate. It's just, a, it's just a great game that has speed and also respect, and um, it's actually a, it's a self-refereed game, so if uh, someone doesn't know a rule, you stop playing, and you explain it to people, and yet it's a competition. It's really quite wonderful, but it's rare, right? It's the very rare sport that can actually go co-ed and not sacrifice uh, as a result. So um, women are competitive, and outside the realm of sport, even, we are competitive very differently from men. And this, the correction I would offer is women are differently competitive. And I've, I've written about this at some length. Um, I'm not gonna cite myself here, but the, the, I think the simplest way to describe the difference is in competition, in discussion, in disagreement, when men have disagreements and when women have disagreements, is overt versus covert. That men are more likely to engage in more public, overt, and finite, bounded in time disagreements, where men are more likely to go up to one another and say, dude, what was that? Okay, can we talk it out? And it's rare that they ask each other to take it outside, but that of course happens, and, uh, and it does go physical, but not very often. Of course, it goes physical much less often with women. Women are more likely to engage in covert competition where uh, the rules aren't necessarily clear. You don't even know you're playing necessarily sometimes, <laughs> right? And it's unbounded in time. Like, when did that game start? When did it end? I don't even know. And it's much less likely to be direct. And so, you know, in science, in business, we have male typical ways, we expect male typical ways more male typical ways of engaging with one another. Like you, you have to be direct, you have to be explicit. Female typical ways, um, they, there's a, obviously a place for them, but uh, they're much more likely to involve, if I've got a problem with another woman, I don't tend to do this, but on average, if I've got a problem with another woman, as a woman, I'm more likely to go around and talk to her friend about it, <laughs> right? Rather than her directly. Uh, and this is a place where women could learn from the ways of men, honestly, um, where we could all be a bit more direct in some ways. Um, but, but noticing just the differences without the value judgment, like finite, uh, men, men's competition tends to be more direct, more finite, more public, and women's competition tends to be more unbounded in time, more indirect, and uh, more private. And more because it's more private, it's more cryptic, it's harder to see, and therefore we end up at this crazy conclusion that people are saying, it's like, oh, women aren't competitive. It's like, no, you just haven't looked at the right place. Like, of course women are competitive. You're just using male standards to understand what female competition is, which of course is a problem in, in many realms. Okay, so before I leave that topic, I will say that, um, you know, once again, uh, it's, we're, talking about, we're talking about populations, um, not, not all individuals um, of any given sex are as I describe them, but I would also just caution uh, that the naturalistic fallacy is that just because something is real doesn't mean that it's good. And in fact, when we are faced with understanding something that maybe we don't like so much, it's better to dig in and say, well, what's true? So that we can better act to change what is true as opposed to hiding what is true or hiding from ourselves. Okay. So some of you will be wondering, that's fine, but isn't that just us? Isn't that just the weird cultures? Isn't that just among Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic peoples, right? Maybe this is just a culture thing. And uh, to address that, I would say there's two lines of evidence. There are babies who haven't been acculturated yet, and there are other cultures entirely. So 
with regard to babies, neonate girls spend more time looking at faces while neonate boys spend more time looking at things. This is compelling research from uh, 23 years ago, and there have been several attempts to, uh, to falsify it or to smear it, uh, which is a sort of an unscientific approach, but um, they, have, they have failed, more or less. Um, I find the research very, very compelling, um, but I will say that it's not, again, it's not cut and dried. It's not that all female babies are looking at faces and all male babies are looking at things. In this case, it's a mobile that they've got strung out for the babies. And these are neonates, these are hours old. I don't know how they convince the mothers to let them do this, but um, they, they've, they've got babies in front of um, faces they don't know and mobiles that they've never met before and, um, and are basically paying attention to where the babies are looking. And male babies indeed, um, some male babies prefer faces, some male babies show no preference at all, but um, you have a strong preference for male babies towards the mobiles, whereas females actually, it's not that female babies have a strong preference towards the faces, um, but female babies, again, some prefer looking at the things, um, but female babies show either a preference for the faces or no preference at all, kind of more generalist. Um, so, the, you know, the boys are already kind of zoning in on, on what is that thing? Let me see if I can take it apart. <laughs> I made up that part. <laughs> Okay, so evidence from other cultures might look like us asking what is considered man's work and what is considered woman's work in non-weird societies. So in other cultures, for instance, who smelts the ore? Who gathers vegetal foods? Who makes baskets? Who harvests crops? I'm gonna share with you some research from 1973. Anthropologists collected data on which sex does what 50 activities across 185 pre-industrial societies. And these next two slides are full of numbers, I apologize, but I love this table so much. I used to give it to my undergrads all the time to make their brains explode. Um, so <clears throat> this is the top half of table one from this 1973 research, which compiled, again, re, uh, data from 50 activities across 185 cultures. The five main columns labeled M and EGF, those are the ones to think to focus on. M, those are, acti those are the number of cultures in which only males do that task. F on the far right, number of cultures in which only females do that task. And the middle one, E, is it's a toss up. Either um, it's never gendered at all or it's just equivalently done by both sexes. So this top half of the table is more skewed because of the way they've tallied it uh, towards the male, the male typical tasks. Hunting large aquatic fauna, smelting of ores, metalworking, lumbering, is anyone surprised to find that these are male typical tasks? <laughs> you shouldn't be, right? They're dangerous and, uh, and they are exactly the behaviors that in at least all of the cultures that these researchers looked at, uh, women do not do. Fine, that's kind of obvious. It gets much more interesting towards the middle of the table, which on this top half is the bottom, is at the bottom. Look at the bottom line, generation of fire. Generation of fire across, and you know, like the, the, each row doesn't add up to 185 because there are lots of cultures where they don't do the thing. Um, but in generation of fire, 40 cultures uh, have that be a male exclusive activity, and 20 cultures, it's a female exclusive activity. So it's kind of gendered, but which sex does what varies by culture which again tells you something about division of labor being valuable without it being about any intrinsic differences between the sexes. Okay, bottom half of the same table, same, um, same columns. The, the very bottom of this is the most female skewed of the activities, things like preparation of vegetal foods and cooking and laundering and spinning. Um, note that none of these activities are as skewed towards uh, femaleness towards female exclusion as some of the activities were skewed towards male exclusion. And I think this is just because these researchers excluded those things that are anatomically and physiologically mandated, right? Lactation and gestation aren't on the list. And so, you know, you don't have the, the activities that actually only women can do. Uh, so, but you do have skew, right? Preparation of vegetal foods is almost always a female task in the, in the society studied. But again, it gets more interesting if we look towards the middle of the table. Check out, um, check out 30, harvesting, okay? That doesn't look very gendered at all. There are 10 societies where the harvesting is only done by the men and 26 where it's only done by the women, but there are a lot of studies where it's done almost equivalently. 
Uh, same with uh, crop tending, even more so, uh, which is um, number 31. Preparation of skins, highly gendered, right? And this is number 26, highly gendered, uh, but which sex does which is highly variable across cultures. So in all of these cultures, it, in almost all of the cultures looked at with regard to the preparation of skins, it seemed like this was important to have this be a gendered activity, but which sex does it varies. Again, this tells us something important about division of labor and, and, and our modern society. So, division of labor is valuable, but the ways that different cultures divide labor is highly variable. And just a review of some of the ones we just saw. Smelting of ores, always done by the guys. Preparation of vegetal foods, very often, like highly likely to be, uh, to be done by, by women only in those pre-weird cultures that were being looked at. Basket making, um, pretty highly gendered in most of the cultures that they were looking at, but which sex does it is highly variable. And harvesting, it's a free-for-all. This isn't a very gendered activity at all. And probably we can, and definitely we should, think about the kinds of activities that we have in our cultures where, in our culture, that we can actually give up on any gender division at all, or if there is any, does it matter? Could it have been the opposite way? Just like with those blue-footed boobies and their calls, where one of the sexes modulates their calls on amplitude and the other one on frequency, and it probably could have been the other way around. It's just the difference is what matters. Okay, many of the historic reasons to divide work by sex are antiquated now, of course. And it's going to be easier to convince the world of that uh, if we recognize that even in pre-industrial times, um, there was a lot more variation in what was expected of each sex than we are sometimes led to believe. Okay, in conclusion, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of time for questions, I apologize for that. Uh, in, in summary, sex is real, sex is ancient, it's not going away, there are two and only two sexes. Gender is downstream of sex, uh, and it's highly variable. And yes, there are real differences between the sexes that include things like uh, propensity to particular types of mental illnesses and interest in particular kinds of, kinds of tasks. Um, but even those things can change, are changing at a societal level, and division of labor is valuable in some contexts. But wouldn't we all be better off, I think, at this point, instead of trying to split the world into like, is that woman's work? Is that man's work? Can she do that? Is that, kind of, is that an acceptable thing for him to do? Let's focus on individuals and their abilities and interests and allow them to come to their full flourishing. So are we stuck with the sex differences? Yes and no. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions, I think. Maybe you can just yell, yeah. <laughs> um, we are part of a boys group that has about 200 under 18 and 200 over 18. And we did a survey and we found that 85% of our boys were gifted with some extremely gifted. A lot of them are either on the autism spectrum or suspected of being on the autism spectrum. We call them the brilliant morons. <laughs> so they kind of fit both sides of the spectrum. So I guess my question is, do you think, what do you think it has to do with maybe not being able to read all those gendered social cues and navigate the world in an gender way, like, do you have any thoughts on that? How autism and figuring things out plays in these gifted kids? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. Obviously, autism is one of the things that is much more prevalent in males and females. Um, and I, I suspect that it is related to, there's a question back there, Stella, um, for next. Um, I suspect it's related to the differences that we see uh, in, um, in linguistic and, and to some degree, like quantitative, quantitative skills. That the early, even the babies focus on things rather than faces. Uh, the, uh, the different kinds of memory, like we, some of that research around gist and details demonstrates that 
not only do we remember different things, but we remember things differently. Like both of those things are true, right? So boys um, being more interested in, at some level on average, the mechanics of the universe, um, can, you know, high functioning autists um, can be excellent at moving around a room and knowing what to do. They just have to learn what it is that they're supposed to do as opposed to do it in the moment, right? And so the more, the, the more fluid and flexible, open-ended, private, you know, all of these different ways that I was describing, sort of more female typical as opposed to male typical kinds of competition is also, I think, going to apply across more domains than that. It's not a complete answer, but maybe it's a start. Good morning. So I'm from a developing country, Jamaica specifically, and I sometimes, I'm hearing people nowadays say things like, you know, the sex binary is an oppressive Western creation, which, <laughs> you know, to me coming from, <laughs> to me it's, absurd, it's as absurd as saying that slavery is a European creation because it's not. Slavery has existed throughout history. Euro Europeans were nowhere near the first people to practice it, right? And I as a black man can say that, yeah? <laughs> so when I hear people saying that, no, I, I just think to myself, you know, I'm from, I'm not from a weird country. My friends aren't from weird countries. And when I start telling them the sort of things they're saying here in America, they look at me like, are these people crazy? <laughs> what are your yeah. thoughts? Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, more questions like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, more question. Yeah. Just keep it pointing. I have a question about the asexual lizards. Do they end up living differently than the non-asexual lizards? Like, do they pass away earlier? Yeah. Mm. I suppose so, but he was the one that just kept me. Yeah, um, in, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Interesting question about like disease etiology in asexual versus sexual species that are sister, spa sister taxa, and so you could do a direct comparison. I don't think that particular research has been done. I don't think that question has been answered, although it's a big research group. They may have done that, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, you might expect, actually, uh, that life expectancy in the asexual species was longer if, you know, if, if they've gone asexual because the particular part of the vast desert in the American Southwest and Northern Mexico where they live uh, is particularly stable and, uh, and that works uh, and therefore they're not getting picked off by pathogens and parasites and competitors and predators um, at a particularly high rate um, that because in general across species including humans females live longer than males that's another sex difference you know life expectancy in females is longer than males and that's not an artifact of modernity that is you know, that is just true males have the you know the glib version is the strategy is live fast die young and, um, and so in, in all female species, the asexual species might well, although again, I'm just hypothesizing, I don't know, um, actually have slightly longer average lifespan than the sexual species. Thank you. All right, thank you. One more, one more. <laughs> Take a couple of more questions. Uh, that was really, really fascinating. So just a couple of more questions. Sure. Hands up, anybody? Have you got a mic? Yeah. Um, so, so my question was, uh, when you said that the male gamete uh, you know, was stripped off everything except the, uh, the DNA, and the female gamete had you know, uh, lots of other stuff, did that, and, and you know, that started uh, 500 million years ago? That two, started something like 2 billion years ago. Two, uh, yeah. uh, and before that, there wasn't uh, something like that. Um, so did that mechanism happen overnight that, you know, or was there a phase where it was being kind of debated out and then they found out, no, this is the best thing? I, I, I love, evolutionary biologists tend to anthropomorphize in our talk a lot, but I love the idea of the debate two billion years ago. Yeah, I, mean, between uh, the this, um, I mean, the, you know, the ideas being that, uh, yeah. the ideas being debated. Yep. I mean, that, of, that, of course, so, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't know. 
uh, gametes don't fossilize, uh, so and we don't have a time machine, so we have no idea. But you know, was it? You know, how did how what was the moment of sex evolving? I don't know if Colin's going to go there at all. I, I just don't think we know. Yeah, um, I in fact, I, you know. I, this is, this is a literature, a scientific literature that I used to be very enmeshed in, and I haven't looked in a couple years, but um, it doesn't, I don't think that anyone has even um, really hypothesized a, uh, a mechanism of action, although I'm gonna ask Carol Hooven later and see if she knows anything on this topic as well. Um, so, uh, on um, uh, whether or not uh, the gametes evolved, uh, the anisogamy evolved, immediately or if there was some intermediate phase. There was an intermediate phase and uh, that probably didn't last very long because it wasn't very stable. From what I understand, it's what you described and then what's stable. Yeah, okay, good. So, so apparently, um, Carol, who is the other person who could have given the talk that I just gave, um, but specifically with regard to um, the sex differences, um, says probably there was an intermediate phase that very quickly became, you know, Disruptive evolution basically said, you know, those intermediate gametes don't work. Um, no one's finding them, and when they do meet, they disagree about who's going to uh, contribute to cytoplasm, and so you end up with the disruptive evolution to an anisogamy to the sex binary. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.